Hey guys, Wilker Patrick, nursing educator in Psychorsetta. Today we're going to go over the differences between respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, and metabolic alkalosis. We're going to make it very simple and easy for you guys. Now at the end of this video, we're going to briefly go over ABG interpretation and compensation, but we do have a specific more detailed course for that on our top right corner here if you click this link. Now we're going to get right into it. We're not going to waste any time. Download our free ABG worksheet on our website, tactilevr.com. The link is down below in the description. Okay, so let's go into respiratory acidosis. Each one of these, we're going to go over the pathophysiology, the signs and symptoms, and the management. So these are all concepts that you will need to know for your nursing exam. First, starting out with respiratory acidosis. So respiratory acidosis is defined by a pH that's below 7.35 and a CO2 that is above the 45 mark. A normal CO2 level is 35 to 45. If it's above that 45, it is respiratory acidosis. What is the pathophysiology behind this? It's actually very simple. CO2 is controlled by the lungs at all times. The lungs are very quick and fast acting. Of course, we can change our respirations at any given time, but we also have an internal communication. If our CO2 levels are high in our blood, our lungs compensate by increasing the respiratory rate to get rid of that CO2. To also make sure that our pH remains in normal range. Now, if our lungs fail to get rid of that CO2, we have something called respiratory acidosis. So the pathophysiology, the most common things that are causes of this are someone who has respiratory failure or any type of ventilation issue. So patients with COPD, pneumonia, or respiratory depression with a respiratory rate below 12. Because once again, what are the lungs supposed to do? They're supposed to get rid of that CO2. If they can get rid of that CO2, it stays in our blood. And then that's where we get respiratory acidosis. Now what's happening on the other side? What if our lungs are just not working? So what else can our body do? Well, we also have our kidneys, which is a buffer system for our acid-base balance. The kidneys control something called bicarb, which is HCO3. Now bicarb is alkaline, so it's the opposite of acidic. So what our kidneys do to compensate for this respiratory acidosis is hold on to more bicarb. By holding on to more bicarb, we're actually compensating the fact that there's more acidosis. So it's trying to keep the pH in a balanced level. So what are the signs and symptoms associated with respiratory acidosis? Well, hopefully we're going to see some compensation by the lungs. So we're going to see an increased respiratory rate, an increased heart rate, and an increased blood pressure because the kidneys are needing more blood. So the blood pressure is going to be increased by the sympathetic nervous system. Now, because of the buildup of CO2, it's very toxic to the brain. So you're going to see also some confusion. And then lastly, you're going to see hyperkalemia. So hyperkalemia happens when there's a buildup of acidosis in the body. So there's an excess of hydrogen ions. So what happens is our body compensates. The potassium likes to stay inside the cell. So when there's acidosis in the blood, the potassium exchanges with the hydrogen ions, which are acidic, they exchange. So the hydrogen goes back into the cell. The potassium leaves the cell and gets back into the extracellular fluid, which causes a high amount of potassium in the blood aka hyperkalemia. This is just another attempt of the body to reduce the amount of acidosis in the blood. Now that potassium stays in the blood with respiratory acidosis because bicarbonate and potassium have a same relationship where the kidneys are trying to retain the bicarb, so the potassium at the same time is also going to be held and maintained. So the kidneys will not spill that potassium like they normally would. Now management of this is just simply reversing the CO2 buildup. So a lot of the times with patients with respiratory acidosis, as we've mentioned, these are patients with COPD, pneumonia, or respiratory depression that are on the brink of respiratory failure. So usually the treatment for this is, of course, improving ventilation is your number one priority. And if that doesn't work, and a lot of times by this time, the patient's airway is being compromised, so then it would cause an intubation. How else as nurses can we help improve ventilation? Number one, semi-phalarous position. There's going to be a question about that. Coughing and deep breathing bronchodilators, and oxygen supplementation. All right now, so respiratory alkalosis, so the opposite of respiratory acidosis. Respiratory alkalosis is defined by a pH above 7.45 and a CO2 below 35. So once again, the CO2 is going the opposite direction of the pH because it's due to the respiratory system. Now we talked about respiratory acidosis being caused by poor ventilation. Well, respiratory alkalosis is the exact opposite. There is hyperventilation. Our lungs are excreting so much CO2 that it's actually causing an alkalosis balance in our body. So once again, the kidneys are going to try to compensate by excreting bicarb, which is alkaline. Your most common cause of this is hyperventilation and tachypnea, so a fast breathing rate above 20 breaths per minute. Other common causes may be hyperthermia, aspirin toxicity, and then mechanical ventilation. If the respiratory rate is too fast, they're expelling too much CO2. Now signs and symptoms of this is directly related to the pathophysiology. 
tachypnea, so a fast breathing rate. They're going to be lethargic because it's a lot of energy. Tachycardia, numbness and tingling, and then hypokalemia and hypocalcemia. Now, side question. What is associated with hypocalcemia? You're going to have Shostak sign and Trisal sign. So make sure you guys write that down. Now, the hypokalemia and the hypocalcemia occur because our kidneys are once again compensating. So they're spilling the bicarbonate to get rid of the alkalosis. And they're also, in turn, spilling the potassium and the calcium because the renal threshold has increased and the kidneys are now diuresing to help compensate that high alkaline level. Now, the treatment for respiratory alkalosis can vary depending on the actual cause. So we treat the underlying cause. Some causes, of course, most commonly being hyperventilation. Well, what would be the cause of that? A lot of times it's anxiety. So anxiolytics would be the treatment. Rebreathing into a paper bag to retain the CO2 is another intervention. And implementing breathing techniques that help slow down their respiration rate. And of course, there's probably going to be a question about it. You need to monitor for hypokalemia and hypocalcemia. Hey guys, it's Wilker Patrick, nursing educator in Psych Corsetta. I want to let you guys know that I will help you with anything you need at any time if you just send me a text at 940-218-4062. 940-218-4062. Let's get back to the video. All right, guys, so let's talk about metabolic acidosis now. So metabolic acidosis is defined by a pH below 7.35 and a bicarb level that is also below 22. Now, the pathophysiology behind metabolic acidosis is associated with deficient excretion of hydrogen ions from the kidneys. The number one cause for this is renal failure or any sort of renal injury, diarrhea, aspirin toxicity, and very commonly also caused by diabetic ketoacidosis. So since it's the kidney's fault this time, what are the lungs trying to do to compensate? Well, since it's acidosis, the lungs control CO2, which is what? Acidosis. So the lungs are trying to increase the respiration rate to expel more CO2 to balance the body out. So what are your signs and symptoms? Confusion. Once again, CO2 is very toxic to the brain. It's going to cause confusion. Now, since we just talked about the respiratory system compensating for that high acidic level, it's going to try to blow off that CO2. So we're going to see a sign and symptom called Kussmaul respirations which is heavily also associated with diabetic ketoacidosis. Kussmaul respirations are defined by deep and rapid respirations. Think of it no different than when you're exercising. It's just like that, but they're just sitting there in bed. Once again, since there's acidic levels of hydrogen in the blood, the potassium is going to lead the cell to exchange the hydrogen to compensate that acidosis, so you're going to have hyperkalemia. And what is associated with hyperkalemia? Dysrhythmia. So that's another sign and symptom that you need to look out for as a nurse with metabolic acidosis. All right, so management. So what is the problem with this issue? We're going to treat the pathophysiology. We're unable to excrete hydrogen ions, and we don't have enough bicarb. So we're going to replace the bicarb. Bicarb administration is a common intervention for metabolic acidosis, but we need to watch out for something when we give it. This is a very common concept question on your nursing exam, so you want to write this down. When you give bicarb, you want to look out for hypo. Kalemia. Because of the potassium that left the cell to compensate for those excess hydrogen ions, those are now going to be reduced because of the bicarb administration. So it's quickly going to shift back into the cell and then they're going to be left with hypokalemia. And also we want to encourage fluids with metabolic acidosis because once again, it's likely due to a kidney injury of some sort. Now it depends on your patient. In general, you want to increase the fluids because you want to increase the filtration of the kidney. By increasing that filtration, you're getting rid of more hydrogen ions. All right, guys, so lastly, we're on metabolic alkalosis. So metabolic alkalosis is defined by a pH above 7.45 and an HCO3 that is also high above that 26. Now metabolic alkalosis is bicarb overload. There's too much production of bicarb and the kidneys aren't able to compensate fast enough to maintain a normal pH balance. Now the lungs once again are responsible for compensating. So what do the lungs control? They control CO2. CO2 is acidic. So what they do is they hold on to CO2, which causes respiratory ventilation to decrease. That acidosis is counteracting the alkalosis buildup of the bicarb. The normal causes of this is vomiting and gastric suction. Antacid use is another common thing question about on your nursing exams. So if there's a patient using a lot of antacids, then it's really high in bicarb, so that may be the cause of your metabolic alkalosis. Other common causes is long-term diuretics and hypokalemia. Why, you may ask? Because long-term diuretics, of course, cause potassium to spill, but it also causes bicarb to spill. But when there's a long-term compensation of that, if diuretics are being used for a long time, it causes a compensation for the kidneys to hold on to bicarb. What's the cause of metabolic alkalosis? Too much production of bicarb. So when there's a low amount of potassium in the blood, aldosterone levels decrease to hold on to that potassium. 
Well, in return, they also hold on to bicarb. So once again, you're having a buildup of bicarb. So common signs and symptoms with metabolic alkalosis is respiratory depression. You guys need to write that down. That is a very common concept that is questioned about on your nursing exam. They're going to have a low respiratory rate, tachycardia, and signs and symptoms of hypokalemia. Once again, management is really related to the underlying cause. So if there's a lot of vomiting, if there's gastric suction, we want to prevent them from vomiting so we get them anti-emetics. We want to increase the renal filtration to get rid of that bicarb, so we're going to give them IV fluid. We're going to monitor the potassium and replace as needed. And then number one priority, guys, this will be asked, monitor the respiratory status and monitor for respiratory depression. Once again, remember the compensation of the lungs is what causes this respiratory depression. The high levels of alkalosis, the lungs control CO2, which is acidosis. Well, since there's so much alkalosis, the lungs are going to slow down, hold on to that CO2, and then that's going to cause respiratory depression. So that is where you guys see this is a number one priority for metabolic alkalosis. All right, so now we talked about how we're going to briefly go over how to do ABG interpretation and compensation. We're going to do three practice problems together. Well, once again, guys, if you want more detail on how to actually interpret ABG, then you guys will go to our ABG interpretation and compensation course that goes in much more detail about this. Also, guys, download our free ABG worksheet in the description below. Let's get right into it. So we're going to go into a couple practice problems here. Our first practice problem is a pH of 7.48, a CO2 of 32, and HCO3 of 24. Okay, so step number one. We need to determine if it's acidosis or alkalosis. What's the normal range for a pH? It's 7.35 to 7.45. This is above, so this is alkalosis. Okay, step number two. Is it respiratory or is it metabolic? Okay, we need to determine. You can either use the tic-tac-toe method or the Rome method. We're going to show both here and how to apply that. But if you look here, this is considered respiratory alkalosis. Okay, so now step number three, we need to determine if it's uncompensated, partially compensated, or fully compensated. If you guys remember those rules that partially compensated, everything is abnormal. If it's fully compensated, that means the pH would be normal. In this case, we have neither, so this is uncompensated. Now the pathophysiology behind that, it's respiratory's fault that there is an alkalosis. Okay, so it's bicarb's responsibility to change in order to compensate that level. Well, what controls bicarb? The kidneys. But as you guys can see here, bicarb is within its normal range, so it's not helping. So that's why we call it uncompensated. Problem number two, we have a pH of 7.32, a CO2 of 48, and HCO3 of 27. Step number one, is it acidosis or alkalosis? Okay, we see here that it is below the 7.35. It is acidosis. Okay, next step, is it respiratory or is it metabolic? Okay, if we use the tic-tac-toe method or the row method, you can see here that it is respiratory acidosis. Next, we want to determine if it's uncompensated, partially compensated, or fully compensated. If you follow the rules here, every value here is abnormal. So that means it is partially compensated. Next problem, we have a pH of 7.30, a CO2 of 40, a bicarb of 18. All right, so is it acidosis or is it alkalosis? We have a pH that is below 7.35, so it is acidosis. Next step, is it respiratory or is it metabolic? Using the tic-tac-toe method or the row method, you will see here that it is metabolic acidosis. Step number three, is it uncompensated, partially compensated, or fully compensated? As you see here, it is uncompensated because the CO2 is supposed to be helping, but it's in normal range. If we use those rules, it's not partially compensated because everything would be abnormal, but the CO2 is in normal range, and it's not fully compensated because the pH is out of range as well. So we know that it is uncompensated. Hey guys, first of all, thank you so much for watching the video entirely through. It makes our day if we know that nursing school got a little bit easier after watching one of our videos. If you guys like this video, make sure you like it, subscribe to the channel for more, and drop down in the comments for any more ideas that you need help with nursing school. If you want to contact me personally, it's 940-218-4062. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you in the next video.